Well, Christ is risen. Yeah. Amen. Thanks to Cliff and Living Sacrifice. We're here because Jesus died according to the scriptures. But that's what happens to all of us. And he was buried as they do the dead, according to the scripture. But on the third day, he rose again, and he is alive. And what that means for you and me, and what he has conquered through what he has done on the cross is what this morning is about. You know, God's not far off. He's not somewhere out in the heavens. He's here. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is near. It's right at the door of your heart. Uh, He's right in this room. He knows your name. He is superintendent of your life to bring you here this morning. And uh, it's his voice we want to hear. It's him we want to listen to. As we think about the reality of death, it's something that I hate. I hate death. And I hate the separation that it brings and the reality that it waits all of us. But there is something about this that just tells us this is not right. This is not the way it was meant to be. There's something about the separation and the loss of life for those we love and care about that just reminds us this is not the way it should be. You know, they tell us as they look back that it's always been that way, that it's always about the survival of the fittest, that we are born, we struggle, we die, we've done that as species, we've done that for billions of whatever, and that's just life. That's just the way it is. And somewhere in between, born and struggle and dying is is where we all are but there is something about that that just seems wrong and it isn't the way it was meant to be I was watching a discovery series called The Frozen Planet it was fascinating Uh, it takes uh, into the Arctic and Antarctica and we were watching uh, the first night it's one of the reasons I hate nature shows because it was showing this pack of orcas uh, in pursuit of a seal and what the orcas do is they uh, pull the, get its tail, and then they pull the seal down and drown it. Uh, and then they have, have their feast. And this seal had fought this valiant battle and uh, continually defending its tail and, and biting and trying to keep it out of the way. And it struggled from one ice floe to another. And, and it was in this long, valiant battle. And you just find yourself there rooting um, for the seal. Finally, it climbed up exhausted on one flow of ice, just enough to get on. But when the camera looked into its eyes, you saw that despair, that defeat. It couldn't move. If he moved just a little bit, he would have been safe. But one of the orcas bobbed up out of the water, grabbed it by its tail. But as I was pulling it under the water, it's just that picture in that ice that I just haven't been able to forget, death. There's something about that that seems wrong, that it isn't the way it should be. As I remember when we were pastoring in Colorado, two of our men had been uh, hunting on horses back in the front range um, of the Rocky Mountains, and I got a call early in the morning from one of them. And that night before, coming back late to camp uh, with dark almost there on their horses, one of the horses spooked and started to charge through the forest, and a branch of a tree went through Dave's eye socket, uh, severed his brain stem, and he was instantly dead. And his friend had to be with him there all night and had gotten ridden down, gotten the help, and called me. Dave had a, a wife and a three-year-old daughter, and it was my job to go tell her that her husband wasn't coming home, that a three-year-old daughter was um, not going to have a father to raise her up. I hate death. And I hate that reality it brings. And there's something about that that says, that shouldn't be. Wives shouldn't have to be separated from their husbands. Three-year-olds shouldn't have to lose their fathers. Is this what it is? Is it survival? Is it just that we struggle for life as long as we can, and, and then inevitably it comes, we're born, we struggle, we die? And then what happens? Where do we go? And and that whole reality of death is not only the reality that takes our loved ones away, but what happens? Where do they go? As Shakespeare puts so many of our attitudes and hearts into plays, and one of them is Hamlet, 
And Hamlet was this dark play of this uh, intrigue and behind the throne and pride and jealousy and murder and cover-up and misery and those who got to the throne through death and how they hated it. And Hamlet just kind of looked at his life and it was painful, it was miserable. And he began to think it would be better to die. It's better just to go into the sleep of death than to deal with a struggle that I'm dealing with in my painful life. And so he has this famous soliloquy when he just kind of wrestles with that issue. Should he go on when it just means struggle and pain or should he just go into that sleep? He says this, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them, to die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks the flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream. Ah, there's the rub. For in the sleep of death, what dreams may come? So I thought better to sleep, better than to go on with a struggle. But then what will happen? And he says this, but that dread of something after death the undiscovered country from whose born no travel returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than to fly to others we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus dealing with the uncertainty reality of, of death and what follows, he finds it better to go on with life no matter how painful and how struggle it is. And maybe you're experiencing that this morning as you come here into that reality. And we're going to come and speak that this reality of death and that there is this puzzle to life. It is that we put all the pieces together. And maybe you've tried to do that with your life. You put all the pieces together and, and then it, it just doesn't seem to fit. It's like there's something missing. And it's what this day's about, about Jesus, that one who's missing, that makes the puzzle fit, that helps us see. I want to go to Hebrews chapter 2. There should be a Bible underneath an armrest near you, if you look around you, and we're on page 1001 uh, in those Bibles, and we have nothing to say here but the Word of God and what, uh, seek to understand what it says. And uh, we're over in Hebrews 2, we want to start over verse 5, but let me just kind of set it in context. The, the writer of Hebrews is writing to people that have come out of Judaism, they've come out of the old temple sacrifice, and they've come to Jesus, but now they're being tempted to go back and saying, you know, maybe we ought to go back to the old religious rites and practices and rituals. And, and so the writer of Hebrews is writing to say, don't you ever do that. And, and he is starting out with this triumphant truth that Jesus is superior to all else. And he's been talking about that Jesus uh, is the last word of God to us, that God has spoken in many times and ways in times past by the prophets in other ways. But these last days, he has one word to us, and that's Jesus. And he's talking about the angels, and he's talking about the reality that there was a day when, when angels sinned. About a third of them followed Satan in rebellion and tried to throw God off the throne and saying, we don't need God, we can be God on our own. The same lie he, he sold to Adam and to Eve, and there was this battle for the throne. And about a third of the angels joined Satan in his, his rebellion. Of course, he was defeated. You can't take God off the throne. But the reality is that Jesus is greater than the angels. But the writer of Hebrews is saying that God didn't do anything for the angels that sinned. They are forever sealed. Hell was created for them. Some of them are there that refuse to live under the lordship of God over his creation. But, they, they, uh, but God didn't send anyone for angels when they sinned. But he has for us. And it is that which is happening. And, and Hebrews 2 is one of the most fascinating parts of Scripture I've ever read. Um, this, this winter term and coming into spring, I've spent so much time thinking this through. And as if God just brings us and sits us down and says, okay, here's what I meant for you to know. It's an amazing story. Hebrews 2, verse 5. This is the Word of God, so let's stand up one more time and then you can sit and I'll keep standing. We were in the Masters Golf Tournament. We've been standing all day, so that's, that's okay. <laughs> So verse, Hebrews 2, verse 5. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. 
Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. May God add his blessing and understanding to his word. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, this amazing truth that is given to us about Jesus. You know, the Bible tells that God is all-knowing. There isn't anything he doesn't know. Uh, All things came from him. And yet it says that Jesus, who is God the Son, when he came, learned something. That when Jesus came, he learned something he didn't know as God. And it's an amazing thing, and it says that, that he had to become one of us. He had to take on flesh and blood for God's purposes in reaching us. And notice as he talks about the death of Jesus in verse nine, it says that as it comes to the end of the verse nine, that death of Jesus was the grace of God for us. That Jesus, as it said, that he might taste death for everything, everyone was God's grace for us. And then it brings this amazing verse, verse 10, for it's fitting that he for whom and by whom all things are just, exist in bringing many sons to glory, made the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. It was fitting for Jesus not only to be born and come and learn and suffer, it was fitting for Jesus to die. That word fitting is something that puts it, everything in place. It's just like this is what it was designed for. And, and it's like life is this puzzle and we keep trying to put the pieces together. And maybe you grew up thinking that marriage and that was going to be the way that your life is together together or you're going to find a career and job. And, and you've been trying to fit all the pieces together and it just doesn't work. It doesn't last. And then even if it did, death comes. And that Jesus is that missing piece who's come to help us understand life, but understand our life. It was fitting for him to come. And dealing with the reality of death, that he had to take on flesh and blood, and he had to die, as we'll see in a moment. And that it was fitting. It was the missing piece. It is what restored and brought back life in what it is and and for eternity. You know, we're all going to die, apart from Jesus' return, which I think might be very soon. But it's the last thing they're going to say about you. And he died. And she died. And that issue of life is... How do I find meaning and significance? And Leo Tolstoy, an intellectual and, and a brilliant man, a novelist from Russia in the 19th century, became obsessed with death and, he, and its reality. And he began this long search. What is there in life that death does not destroy? And that reality, and, and he struggled, and he tried to find Jesus and, and in that reality, because what is it, if it all ends with death, what is it that death does not destroy? What is it life should be bad? I remember reading of a, a young girl, her mother was um, ill and was going to die. She was in hospice care. The doctor had come to their home, and it was fall in a part of the country where the leaves actually fall in the fall. 
And uh, as she was there, the doctor was there, and they didn't know the little girl was hearing what they, in the other room. And she asked the doctor, how long do I have? And the doctor says, well, you're not going to last till all the leaves fall. And that next day, the mother was looking out in the yard and looking at her little daughter, and she was running around collecting the leaves and trying to put them back on the tree. It's that reality that comes that we want to stop and know that this isn't what should be. But yet it says that Jesus went through death for us that he might destroy it, its power. Now, what is it that it's talking about, verse 10, that Jesus came, that he would learn? It says he learned obedience through suffering. It says at the end of verse 10 that in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. What is it that Jesus learned that he didn't know as God? Through suffering. What he learned is what it's like to live in this world with the limits of what we have. To battle sin, to battle temptation, to deal with sickness and disease and death and loss. He walked through it all, and it gripped his heart. You see, there's some things you can only learn by experience. Only by experience. I I marvel at the mystery of life and a woman bearing a child and and a whole person growing inside them and and becoming this person. And what's that like? And, 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 And what it must be like to deliver and bring life and through the pain, through the triumph of the new life. But I'll never know that. Because I can't experience it. And there's something that Jesus learned that he only learned because he became one of us. And you know, as Jesus learned that, you know what he learned? He learned it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy to live in flesh and blood in a world in which sin and temptation is there. Sin is powerful and it's tempting and it's subtle and it's deceitful. And before you know it, he's in it. Jesus saw it to the ultimate because he never gave in to sin. But he realized this is not easy. As he dealt with what death was bringing, when a widow was bringing her only son out for burial from a village, as Jesus saw that and saw what death is like and what a mother experienced, and he raised that child back to life. But he learned this is not easy. And he learned it in, in ways through suffering that he couldn't have learned from heaven. He couldn't learn by knowing our thoughts. He, he could only learn by being part of us. And, and that reality of what he's experienced has enabled him to help us in this battle with sin and death and reality of life. It's, it's changed him. You know, when you think of someone who is God and his very nature of God who became man and, and dealing with that, and, and of course he triumphed, you know, you would think, well, oh, you know, I did it. I did it. You know, one of, one of the realities of, in the athletic world we find is that gifted athletes are very poor coaches. You know, Michael Jordan's in this world who I just have the ability and just have always had it are very poor coaches because they can't help someone get to where they are. Just work hard, just, you know, discipline. Uh, you know, he's, he's a terrible, even a worse owner, <laughs> says, you know, the Charlotte's only won seven games this year and their only hope is maybe they'll get Anthony Davis or something else, you know. But Jesus was different. He made him tender. It made him know that what you're walking through is not easy. And that he can help. You see what it says about him there at the end, down in verse 17 of chapter 2. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help. Those who are being tempted. He knows what it's like. He knows it's not easy. And he knows the help you need. And as Jesus has come and be part of us, that we'll see this resurrection triumph in the, in the future that we have secured with God. But there is that in between. And Jesus has come to be your friend. He has come to come alongside. He's merciful. He's faithful. And he knows it's not easy. Not easy to see a mother with concern for a child and not able to change the circumstances. Not easy 
for a husband to, to lay his wife in the grave of 60 years and go back to an empty home. Not easy. And that Jesus knows how to help. One of the uh, trips that I'm on, and we were on several years ago to the Congo, which we've had a connection with in this church going back to uh, our founding days. And we, when the Congo is, is arguably the most dysfunctional nation in the world, and it's been through civil wars and still continues on, and the part we are where we've had a connection with the covenant, and God's just alive and doing amazing things um, in the Ubangi part of, of Congo. And we went to people who had nothing. They, they, they just barely they had what they had for the day and the clothes on their back. And everywhere we went, they sang with such joy and passion in Langala. What a friend we have in Jesus. And she looked at those people and realized the tough life they were facing. And many had, or widows there who had lost their husbands young. And, and yet they had a, a peace in life. They had a, a joy in life because they had a friend who, yes, he's God and yes, he's Lord, but he knows. You know, the spiritual says, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. See what it says of him there in, in verse 17, as he has come to bring us into his salvation, he is pleased to call us brothers. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will make of your name to my brothers. In the name of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And so that I have at the right hand of God, who has all authority, a friend who understands and has the help that I need, not just to make it, but to try it. And to know as the trials of life come that I have someone with me, and he's enough, and his help is real and there. What a friend we have in Jesus. But it was necessary for Jesus to come and be part of us, not only to learn what we're dealing with and how he could help us, but to take away what it is that we are living in fear of, and that's death, and, and that Jesus came and took on flesh and blood, that he might go through the cross, that he might, by the grace of God, it says in verse 9, taste death for everyone. It says there, as we go down to verse 14, this, this reality that the devil has the power of death. Now, how does anyone have power over, against God? It says in verse 14, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. What, what, is, what is the devil? Why does he have power in death? Now, you have to understand when the Bible talks about death, it's in contrast to God, and God is life. And so die is to be separated from God. We're born that way, but it isn't the way it started. God created this world perfect. And he created this world without sin, without disease, without sickness, without wars, without chaos, without orcas chasing seals. That isn't how it started. It hasn't always been survival of the fittest and you're born and you struggle and you hold on as long as you can and you die. It isn't the way it's always been. God created it in harmony. He created it in peace. He created it in, in the land to provide all the food or the sea that anyone would need without death becoming part of this. And he put man in the center of the garden and he created us for this perfect world. This world is not how God created it. God created us to know him and to love him and to be in a relationship with him. And for love to be real, there must be a choice not to love. So God put him in a perfect garden, prepared the garden for him. He didn't have to plant it just to take the fruit that God had already prepared. And God said, there's one thing I, I don't want you to do because love needs this test to establish its evidence. There's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to eat of that. Because the day you eat it, you're going to bring death. And you're going to bring its curse to all of creation. And of course, we know the story, but yet we can't be Adam and Eve's critics. Because we know in the choices we've made, we would have done the same. We would have done the same. 
And they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and death came. It separated them from God, but it brought what this creation is knowing, what Romans 8 says, it's subjection to this futility because of the choices that we made. And God is holy and righteous, and, and he made us to love him, and love to be real, it must be choice, and so God didn't create us to be automated beings that just are programmed to love, or else there's no meaning to it. There's no meaning to your love, unless it is from your heart. And we rejected, and that brought the judgment of God. And the devil gained power because now we were separated from God. And death, if we were to die separated from God, brings us into everlasting judgment. It brings us into hell, separation from God forever, which the devil wants for you. He hates you. He doesn't want any loyal devotion. He doesn't want worship. He mocks those who worship him. Because we bear the image of God. We, we are made for the glory and in the image of God. And because of that, he hates us. And he lies and deceives and, and, and tricks us. He, he's in Tulsa, Oklahoma with this unbelievable, just randomly going down the, 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 the streets and shooting people, three dead, two wounded, just because he didn't like their color. If you want to know what the devil's like, look in Tulsa. Look in Northern uh, California at the Oikos Nursing College with, with a man that didn't make the grade and was thrown out and wanted his money back and wasn't able to get his money back. And he went back with this 45 that he bought several weeks before with three clips to go back. You want to know where the devil is? He's there. And if you really want to know he is, you look in your heart. His power needs to be broken. And death was his ultimate tool. Because once we die, then we're separated forever. That's why so many of you have thought at times of suicide. One of the things we're learning about youth today is that many have thought life would be better without them. That's his life. He wants your soul not for himself, but to destroy it. So it was necessary for Jesus to become one of us. It was necessary for him to take on his flesh and blood, for he became our champion. Sin and Satan and death were the enemies we couldn't conquer, we couldn't control. I'm sure all of you have sins that you have not been able to overcome and are there, and you still can't believe that it's still you and, and all of that, and Jesus understands that, but that sin's power must be broken. And so Jesus became our champion. He came to take our place, and he went to the cross to to take on sin, to take on the devil, to take on death. And he triumphed. He triumphed. See, see what it says, verse 14, follow down there. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through fear of death who are subject to lifelong slavery. And that Jesus conquered because what separated us from God was our sin. And religion couldn't solve that. You're being baptized or crawling up steps in, in penance or saying so many prayers or so many hails this or that or, or your desire to, to make your life good from what has been bad. Nothing can take away our sin. And so it says there in verse 17 that Jesus came. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation is, is a judicial term. Propitiation talks about that when sin is done, justice, righteousness is, is offended and rouses it up to say, that must be judged. The, the judge with, with propitiation is not dispassionate. He, he sees what we've done and how we've hurt and ruined and what he has made and destroyed the planet that he has given us. And, and it rouses in him not only an offense to his holiness, but this righteous wrath that sin must be judged. But what God has done is put all of that wrath on Jesus. 
That's what propitiation is. It is that which takes away wrath. It not only solves the problem of of justice being satisfied, it solves the issue of justice being offended. And that what we saw on the cross was not the cynical brutality of the soldiers, not the indifference of a pilot who, who knew Jesus was innocent but still gave in to have him put to death. What we saw was not the hatred of the religious leaders that were furious at Jesus because he was representing God and taking away people from them. The fury and the wrath of the cross was the fury of God against your sin and my sin. And he took our place. The law allowed a substitute. The Anglo-Norman law in in medieval times allowed uh, for a champion. And a champion could take a place. And sometimes cities were contested not by armies because so much death would come. But they would each choose a a, a champion for their their city, for their king. And the champions would fight and whoever won. and, And Jesus has become our champion. He went to the cross. And he absolutely, totally triumphed. He bore it. He could have called the angels at any point to come down, but it was fitting, the Father said. It was necessary. And it's done. And as it says there in in that verse, uh, verse 14, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death and the devil because he is able to make peace with God. He is able to come and bring us into a relationship with God as the children of God. And death no longer is this dream or this nightmare, this boundary to hell, but death is now my entrance to the presence of God to be absent from the body in Jesus is to be present with the Lord. And, and there's something that happens that Jesus done that this fear of death we had is taken away. When you know Jesus, there, there is something that happens in that reality. Look at Peter, who in the upper room said, Jesus, no matter all else will fall after you, even if it means my death, I will stay with you. What happened to him? When a servant girl challenged him, He denied. Why? Because the fear of death makes cowards of us all. But when Jesus rose, he was fearless. Come against Peter with all the religious leaders, the very ones that had crucified you, didn't matter, put him in prison, didn't matter. Because he had seen death conquered. And he was part of it. You go back to verse 11, you're at the end of 10 and then 11, you see this unbelievable reality that Jesus has brought for us. Let me read 10 again. For it was fitting, it was the missing piece, that he for whom, by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. And that is why he is not called, ashamed to call them brothers. Sanctified is another theological term, but it just means to be declared before God holy. And that God sent Jesus so that he might declare before him, you, as holy. And that those who are made holy God who is receiving us and those who are sanctified, as it says there, verse 11, all have one source. It's Jesus. And that's what today's about. For he has still given that choice to you. And what you're going to do with your heart and your life, there's still the lies of Satan, there's still the deceit. There's still that missing piece. And, and, and you're going to find, if you've not already, that no one else is going to fit and put it together. But Jesus, but notice down in verse 16 who this is for. He said, for surely it was not for angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. He didn't help angels. They are bound for hell, those that are already there, the third that rebelled, and they will be there forever. And he didn't do anything to change their future. But he did, and he uses that phrase in verse 16, the offspring of Abraham. Why Abraham? Aren't we all Adam's children? Yeah. Well, why then is it this promise for the offspring of Abraham? 
You see, the Bible, and we're going to be looking into this uh, next week and in the weeks following as we deal with a living sacrifice. We're going to be looking in the park patriarchs and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and just kind of see how this works out in daily life. And, you know, someone says, I, like, I love the study of the patriarchs. And they said, why? He says, because they make worse decisions than I do. And, <laughs> and we'll see some of that because we don't become perfect. He is. We don't. We're in process. But why Abraham's offspring? Well, Abraham was the first one God came to and said, I want to make a covenant with you. I want to enter a relationship with you, and I want to bless you. And I want to bless you so that you will be a blessing. And I want you to go to a place where I will bring you for a kingdom that will be yours forever. And so here's what you need to do. He was raised in Ur, the gods of, that he was raised with and, and served. They were not the true God. Ur was a very successful, incredibly highly developed society. It had libraries that were, were just loaded with volumes. The houses in, in Ur were two, three stories. This was a highly developed society and world. And, and God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want you to leave the gods of your city. I want you to leave the values of your city. And I want you to come and follow me to a land that you'll never own, but I will give to you. And Abraham had a choice to make and a covenant to enter into. And it said that Abraham believed God. And because he did, it was accounted to him as righteousness. That's an accounting term. It was written into the account of Abraham in heaven, righteous. And we have that same chance to come with Abraham. The Bible says, what do we need to do? We need to stop being the leader of our own life. That's repentance. That's saying, I, I, I give up what I've been doing. I, I can't do it well. It's sin. I give up the leadership of my life. You lead it. And then I'll trust you. I'll follow you. Help, help me know what that is. That's faith. That's how you become Abraham's child, his offspring. It's coming to believe in what Jesus has done and putting your trust in him and giving him the leadership. It's not going to work for you to, to put your trust in Jesus and then go on running your life. It's not going to work. He won't go with it. He only takes one position, leadership. But he's good. He's so good. He is so good. And those who have put their trust to follow him, it all starts somewhere. For me, it was a nine year old old at a Billy Graham crusade. It all starts somewhere. You know, we were having the Titanic come out again as if we need that movie back. <laughs> now in 3D, you know. Maybe if they change the song, I'll be able to watch it again. <laughs> but one of the realities of the Titanic was going back was that almost all of the lifeboats left more than half empty. And that's been one of the puzzling parts of history because it had, it had enough uh, lifeboats for 1,100 people. Only 750 actually were in the lifeboats. Why didn't they get in? You know, they called the, the Titanic the ship that not even God could sink. And they think, well, it's all right. I'll work it out. You know, the deck is slipping, but I can swim. I don't know what they were thinking. But what are you thinking about Jesus? You need to get in the boat. <laughs> you need to trust it in him and let him have your life. And he will take away the fear of death. I used to be scared of thunderstorms, planes. You know, whenever the pitch in the airplane changed, I would just die. What's happening? I don't fear that anymore. Because I found a help, a friend, a God, a Savior, a Lord. And he is so worthy of your trust. We're going to close now. We're going to sing. This day will be over. Now, some of you need to be in the boat that aren't. We want to give you a chance to get in. 
We have, well up here, we'll have some people that would love to share with you some of the next steps if you're wanting to follow Jesus. We have the free Bible out in the back that gives you some helps. Not only a good translation of the New Testament, but how you can be a Christian. It's anyone who wants one, you can have one. But only you can give them your heart. Only you, like Abraham, can enter into the covenant. And we want to give you a chance right now for you to pray with me as we do that. And then for we who know him, to know, you know, I've seen the weather forecast for the world. Frequent and intensifying storms. And now discover the radiation from the plant in Fukushima is now in the kelp off Orange County and into our food chain. You need someone to help. <laughs> and Jesus, he's the only one. He's the only one. Let's pray to him. Father, I, I see faces, some I know, some I don't. But you see all of us. You know all about us. And you want us. And it was you who sent Jesus. And it was right for him to take on flesh and blood. So they could learn how to help us. And that he could save us. Father, thank you that you've made this like a child. That a nine-year-old, a five-year-old can make the choice that we have to. And I pray for each one here that they may be sure they're in the boat with Jesus and trusting him. Lord, lead as we pray in our own hearts what would just bring this to words, just to say to you, dear God, I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. But I believe Jesus came to the cross for my sin. He was my champion. And he paid in full, and he conquered. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sin. I will follow you. Help me do it. And thank you, Lord, that you have come to take away all our fear. Because now what I see is Jesus. And he has conquered. And he's coming. And our eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting the hearts of man before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Happy Easter. God bless you. Let's stand and sing. We'll go.